Okay, so today we are looking at the fourth lesson, which is called How Jesus Runs the Church. I think I stole that title from a book, um, and in your handout, if you still have it, you can see at the end there's that book, uh, which I recommend to you if you'd like to learn more about this. It's actually a really easy read. Um, now, this sounds kind of boring, right? How Jesus Runs the Church, I'm referring to church government. The fancy term for that, if you want it, oops, I forgot to re- erase last times. The fancy term for this is called ecclesiology, and that comes from the, G- the Greek word ekklesia, which means church, and then ology means study of. So this, what we are considering together is ecclesiology. Okay, so this might sound boring, but what I want to submit to you is that this is actually a very interesting, uh, helpful topic, and in God's providence, the reason for that is because one of the reasons for that is it ties directly in with the message we just heard, which is about Jesus presenting the church to himself as spotless and blameless. Ecclesiology is part of the God-ordained mechanism by which God prepares the church to be wedded to him without spot or wrinkle forever. So ecclesiology is important. In America, uh, most people say most people think of church government as basically whatever works in corporate America. You've got one guy who's kind of the CEO. He's got kind of a board that is under him. Uh, and then there's members who come in, and depending on how much they contribute, they have more of a say or less of a say. And it kind of looks like a corporate business. That's how a lot of people think of church government. Hopefully, you know that since we're reformed, that answer is not good enough. And the reason that answer is not good enough is because we don't, we don't ask the question as it relates to the church and theology, what works best. Reformed people ask the question, what's the Bible say? I'm presenting a bit of a stark dichotomy there. Some uh, other types of Christians ask the same question, but I think reformed people answer, ask and answer that question the best. What does the Bible say about ecclesiology? By way of introduction, we're going to look at Belgic Confession, Article 31. In your gray book, that's page 110. And this is what the Belgic Confession says about the officers of the church. That's the the people who are in charge of running the church. Ecclesiology, church government, officers, those who govern. Article 31 says, this is page 110. We believe that ministers of the word of God, elders and deacons, ought to be chosen to their offices by a legitimate election of the church with prayer in the name of the Lord and in good order as the word of God teaches. So everyone must be careful not to push oneself forward improperly, but all must wait until called by God so that they may be assumed, assured of their calling and be certain and sure that it is from the Lord. As for ministers of the word, that's pastors, they all have the same power and authority no matter where they may be, since they are all servants of Jesus Christ, the only universal bishop and the only head of the church. Moreover, to keep God's holy order from being violated or despised, we say that everyone ought as much as possible to hold the ministers of the word and elders of the church in special esteem because of the work they do and be at peace with them without grumbling, quarreling, or fighting. Okay, um, rather than break down everything we just read, I'm gonna, we're going to look to the Bible and show. I'm going to try to show you where the Belgic Confession is getting everything that we just read. You might notice you didn't see the word deacon. Ministers of the word, pastor, elder, they didn't mention deacon. The reason for that is not that, the, that a deacon is not a officer of the church. Deacons are. But it's that deacons are not governing officers, according to the Belgic Confession. Deacons are in charge of uh, mercy ministry. They are the ones that administer uh, the uh, resources of the church to those who need it most. So you have three categories. In the CRC, we call it minister of the word. That's a pastor. And then we have elders. And then we have deacons. Okay, elders do everything that a pastor does except teach. They can teach, uh, but they're not required to teach. But they are required to do everything that I do other than teaching. Everything a pastor does other than teaching. They counsel, they um, oversee the theology of the church, 
Uh, they go to classes meetings, synod meetings. Uh, they go to our council meetings, obviously. Um, they are essentially pastors who don't preach, although some of them also preach. Uh, okay, so those are the, the offices in the church. Um, so let's look at a, th- a few components of the way that we as Reformed people think about this. The first thing is that Reformed people think of the church as the Holy Catholic Church. That might sound weird because we're Reformed and we know that we're different from Catholics. But Reformed people think of the church as the Holy Catholic Church. I believe, Reformed people believe, in the Holy Catholic Church. You probably know as we do the Apostles' Creed, you might notice, you might be thinking about the fact that Holy Catholic, when we, when we do the Apostles' Creed, it has one of these next to it, an asterisk. Because Holy Catholic does not mean Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic is a denomination. The Holy Catholic Church means the Church of Christ that's holy, and Catholic, meaning universal. That's all the word Catholic means. It means the church everywhere. Roman Catholic is not the church universal. Roman Catholic is the church that's in Rome. That's why it's called Roman Catholic. We believe in the holy Catholic church. Why is that important for when we're talking about the way Jesus runs the church? Well, that's important because as Jesus, as God lays down the the framework for how the church should be run, he's laying down a framework for the Holy Catholic Church. What does that mean? Well, that means that as our churches are functioning, they should be connected to one another. Some people call this connectionalism. This is the idea that our churches are not independent, little um, isolated uh, colonies of the kingdom of God. Uh, I have a book um, that's written by a Baptist, and it's about Baptist ecclesiology, and the way that they describe their churches is that their churches are like little colonies. When you go to a Baptist church, it's like a little colony. Here it is. Here's some of the kingdom. Then you plant a Baptist church here. Here's a little colony. And so each church is its own isolated entity. So if one Baptist church does something that the rest of the Baptist church is like, the other Baptist churches don't really have a um, mechanism by which to do anything about it. Many of you might have heard that recently um, Rick Warren, who is part of the Southern Baptist Convention, started ordaining women. And so the Southern Baptist Convention, all the Baptists said, you're not part of our convention anymore. And you know what that did to Rick Warren's church? Nothing. You know why? Because they are their own church. They get to do what they want. The convention is not a denomination. The Southern Baptist Convention is just a network. And so when you get kicked out of the network, you're just, you're not on the network anymore. For us in the Christian Reformed Church, and we are undergoing this process right now with a church called Needland Avenue, if a church in the Christian Reformed Church starts to do something that we, just, that we think is unbiblical, we will say, if you keep this up, we are going to excommunicate you We are going to bar your um, pastor from ordination. We're going to dissolve your church. Now, those people can still gather together. They're not going to go to jail or anything. They can still gather together. But in terms of the CRC, they won't be a church anymore. The ordination uh, will be gone. They will have no authority within the Christian Reformed Church. And uh, funding and things like that, their ability to go to synod and represent their church, all of those things will be taken away. And the reason for that is because... This is what we see in the Bible. Uh, if you have your Bible, you, look, you can look with me in Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, uh, what we have is what some people call the Jerusalem Council. My heading here says the Council at Jerusalem. But really what this was was this first synod. If you're in the Christian Reformed Church, you know about synod. Um, synod is when all the churches in our denomination get together, usually in Grand Rapids, and we once a year we talk about what do we need to do. And so we have Synod 2022, Synod 2023, next year Synod 2024. Acts chapter 15 is Synod 0001, the first synod. Okay, And what this is, is all the leaders of the church, not the members of the church, the leaders of the church getting together in one location, discussing theology, making decisions, going back to their churches and saying, this is what we as a church have decided. 
So we see in verse 1, some men came down from Judea, Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Okay, so this connected church, the early church, Jesus' church, this is not just one church in Jerusalem. There's churches all over the world. Paul is going around spreading the gospel. There's churches all over. And so this doctrine works its way into the church of Christ, which has a bunch of different gatherings all over. And as that doctrine works its way in, some of these churches start to identify the doctrine, and they say, we've got a problem here. Someone's teaching works-based theology. Someone is saying you need to be circumcised, in order to be saved. So what are we going to do about this? Well, let's see what happened. Verse 2, When Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning the issue. What's their solution? Well, Paul, Barnabas, brothers, apostles, elders, the leaders of the church, let's get together And let's talk about this. They convened the first synod. So, if you skip down to verse 4, it says, When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So they're debating this theology. All the people get together, the apostles, the elders, and the heretics come in and they're debating, they're having this discussion. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to look into the matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said, and so Peter starts to say, hey, I'm one of the elders, I'm a delegate to synod. Here's what the Bible says. And he basically says in the following verses, Salvation is by faith alone, not by works. Circumcision is not necessary. Go down to verse 13. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. And then he goes on to say the same thing, essentially, that Peter says. Circumcision is not required. Go down to verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, and they sent this letter by them. So they, they, they hear from James, they hear from Peter, they say no circumcision, and everybody says, yep, we agree with James and Peter. Nope, we disagree with the heretics. Our decision is no circumcision. So what do they do? They make a synodical report. They write down, here's what we found. In verse 23, they send the letter out to all the churches. What's the letter say? The apostles and the brethren who are elders, to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. And then the next verse is say, circumcision is not required to be saved. So, you, so some Baptists will look at this and say, well, this was just one church. It's a church in Jerusalem. But that's not, that can't be accurate because the letter gets sent out. It says right here in Verse uh, 23, it gets sent out to Antioch, to Syria, to Cilicia, uh, who are from the Gentiles. So this Jerusalem council distributes its decision out to the churches all over. What is that? That is very clearly the Holy Catholic Church, the connectionalism, uh, the church functioning as one body. This is the prescription that Jesus has made for the church. So this is why we as Reformed people, we say, hey, you want to plant a church? Great. You need to get the okay from the Christian Reformed Church. You need to go to classes. You need to go to synod. We are going to have oversight. We're going to oversee your theology. We're going to make sure you're teaching what you're supposed to be teaching. You don't get to just go down the street and say, we're opening up the first Reformed Church of of Cerritos. You don't get to do that. You have to have the church Um, you have to have church oversight. Just like I can't say, hey, guess what, guys? I decided I'm going to be a pastor, and I just start preaching, right? I have to go to the church and say, I would like to be a pastor with your eldership oversight. May I do this? And we discern together, this person's called, this church should get planted, these kinds of things. Okay, Um, so that's, that's the concept of connectionalism, the Holy Catholic Church. So who, uh, um, who operates the church? Who, uh, who are the governors, right? We see that the church is supposed to be one entity, and that one entity has governors, right? It's like a country. A country is one entity, but the country has governors, people who govern, rulers, authorities. Who are the uh, governors of this one holy Catholic connected church? Well, they are the pastors and the elders. Basically, really what that means is the elders, because I am an elder myself. 
I'm the president of the, the consistory, which is the elder board. Basically, there's one governing uh, body in the Church of Christ, and that's the elders. You might be saying, well, what about the other people I talked about in Acts 15? Well, the other people, it says brethren, elders, and apostles. Brethren are just other elders, so those are two different words for the same thing. And then the apostles are those who have seen the risen Christ. Um, to be an apostle, you have to be alive at the time of Christ and see Christ, which is why Paul says, I was the last of the apostles, and it was like I was born at the wrong time because I saw Christ after he had already died and rose again. He appeared to me on the road to Damascus. But to be an apostle, you have to see Christ. So there's people running around in the new apostolic reformation and calling themselves apostles and things like that, but it's not biblical. No more apostles, which leaves us with one option, elders. And again, pastors like me are just elders. This is where the word Presbyterian comes from. The word for elder in Greek is presbyteros. That's, that's, that just means elder. And that's why Presbyterians call themselves Presbyterians. They're presbyteros. They're elder-led. Our church is Presbyterian. Uh, we're just Dutch Presbyterian. The pr- people think of Presbyterian as, uh, well, Presbyterian comes from England, and the Christian Reformed Church comes from Holland, but they are the same. We are led by elders, presbyteros. We are Presbyterian. So what I tell people, if you, if you want to know how to tell people what kind of church you're in, and they're not Dutch, they're not going to know what the Christian Reformed Church is, the easy way to say that is we're English pres- or Dutch Presbyterian. Presbyterians come from England. Christian Reformed Church comes from Holland. Same thing. So uh, that's why we're called that, because we're led by elders. Elders are the one level of authority. Deacons uh, do not rule. They disperse um, the goods of the church. Okay, you can see deacons in Acts chapter 6. So we saw elders, Acts 15. You go to um, Acts chapter 6. And this is when um, deacons uh, are created. It says, starting in verse 1, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in a daily serving of food. So the twelve, that's disciples, apostles, Summon the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip a bunch of other people, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. So this is the first ordination of deacons. So what's happening here is um, the apostles are trying to teach the word of God to the churches, and these widows are in the churches, and they're all pooling their money together into the church budget, and the widows say, I don't have enough money because my husband's gone to eat, and so they go to the pastors, the elders, the ones teaching, and saying, I need a little bit of money from the budget, but then other people come in and say, these widows are getting more money than those widows, and so the pastors are finding, spending all their time looking at the budget. Who gets the money? How are we going to disperse this? And so they say, well, this isn't right because an elder's job is to be dedicated to prayer and the ministry of the word. So we need to create the deacons and they're going to be in charge of the mercy ministry, how we dispense with the funds of the church to help people. And so the diaconate, that's the group of men who make up the deacons. At our church, once a year, we have a uh, widow dinner. Uh, if you're a widow, you get invited. If you're a member and you're a widow, you get invited to the widow dinner. And we just to remind them, like, this is part of what the deacons are here for, to serve the widows. Okay, so that's elders, that's deacons. That's the two offices in the church. Um, difference here between Roman Catholics is that Roman Catholics say, oh, there's a bunch more. There's, there's elders, and they're uh, like priests, But then there's also bishops, and then above the bishops, there's cardinals, and then above, and they're like mega bishops, and above the cardinals, there's the pope. And so they've got all these different officers. They add a lot more in. Episcopalians, they say, well, there's no pope, but there are bishops. So they don't just have deacons and elders, they have deacons, elders, and bishops. Um, The reason Episcopalians are 
good ones are brothers in Christ is because they get that notion of bishops from another Greek word. And you might guess what it is. It's not presbyteros, but it's episkopos. That's why they're Episcopalians. Episkopos means overseer. And when we, when Reformed people read episkopos, we say, well, that's another word for elder. When Episcopalians read episkopos, they say that's a bishop and that's a whole different thing. Uh, and so we, as Reformed people, we say, well, it doesn't seem like that's, it seems like it's the same function. When it talks about episkopos, presbyteros, it's the same people doing the same things. They're just different words. There's a lot of different words to say the same thing. They're synonyms. That's the difference between Episcopalian and Reformed. Roman Catholic has a lot of other stuff, and um, they're okay with it not being in the Bible because Roman Catholics say we have two things that tell us what to do, the Bible and church tradition. So if some Catholic way back in the day said this is the way we're going to do it and we've been doing it that way, we don't care if it's not in the Bible because tradition is just as important as the Bible. That's why the Reformation said one of the tenets of the Reformation that you heard today, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Tradition has no authority. Scripture alone has authority. Okay, so these elders, they rule the church, they run the church, and this ordination um, of elders is, as we saw, something that occurs in the Bible. And the elders are tasked with not just Um, overseeing the church, saying, you know, if someone comes in and says, hey, there's this new theology, it's the elder's job, like they did in Acts 15, to say whether the theology is good or bad. Uh, It's also the task of the elders to administer the sacraments. So that's why you all, when we have communion here, you see the elders come forward. Why are the elders coming forward? Because it's part of their task is to administer the sacraments. And that's not just handing out bread and wine, but that is ensuring to the best of our ability, though we won't do this perfectly, ensuring that the people who are receiving the sacrament of Christ are in good standing with Christ. So it's not just that they're handing the elements, it's that they're making sure this person is worthy to receive these elements, which means that they're actually repentant for their sin. So if we have a member of the church or someone who's not a member, what we know about their lives and they're living in willful sin, it's the elder's job to say, I'm sorry, but we are barring you from the table. According to 1 Corinthians 11, uh, you are living in, op- we're all sinners, but you are not repenting of your sin. You're holding on to your sin. You know, if you're living in a, an adulterous relationship would be a good example. You see, the, there's a man who's married to his wife, and, it, and the elders found out that he's sleeping around. Then the elder's job is to go say, hey, you're living in open sin. We're not going to give you these sacraments. That's part of the elder's job. Uh, And the same is the case with preaching. Okay, so this is another difference between us and Baptists. And again, Baptists are our brothers in Christ. They're wonderful people. I was a Baptist for a long time. My mentor is a Baptist. Wonderful people. Uh, But this is another area where we differ. Baptists will say you don't need to be ordained to administer the sacraments or to preach. But Reformed say, well, this doesn't seem biblical. And here's why. I didn't have enough time to get this in my notes. so I'm just going to read it from a book called Preaching in the New Testament. Uh, this is by a man named Jonathan Griffiths. And in this book, what he does is he, he studies preaching in the New Testament. And his conclusion is that those who preach in the New Testament are ordained. Not anybody can just go preach. And so what he does is he looks at the words for preaching in the New Testament. There's three Greek words that are what he says semi-technical words. Evangelomai, which is like evangelism. Uh, Keridzo, which is to make a proclamation. And uh, Katangelo, which is to like um, uh, share a message, right? So these three words that all, they're similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. And so he studies those three words. And what he notices is that when those words are used in the New Testament, here's the result. For those who engage in preaching, that's one of the words, or proclamation, that's another one of the words, where the three key verbs are used, there is typically record within the New Testament of a command or commissioning of some kind for that person to do so. So when you see those words, not when, you know, Rick Warren thinks that when the, 
when Jesus tells the women at the tomb, hey, go tell people that I'm raised from the dead, Rick Warren's like, look, Jesus commissioned a uh, woman to be a pastor. And first of all, that's just awful exegesis. Jesus didn't say, you're a pastor, now go preach a sermon. He just said, tell other people that I'm raised from the dead. But Jesus is also not using one of these words. Okay, but when all those words are used, like, hey, go uh, proclaim this, go preach this. There is always uh, or usually a commissioning or a command. And we can assume that when there is no commissioning or command, that person has been commissioned or commanded by the church. So, for example, Timothy uh, is charged with uh, preaching the word of God. We don't need to hear Paul say, Timothy, you're commissioned. But if Paul is telling Timothy, here's how to preach, we can assume, well, Timothy obviously has been commissioned to do this. So this is the case for the angel who came to see Zechariah, Luke 1. John the Baptist, uh, Matthew 3 and Mark 1. Jesus, Luke 4, uh, two places in Luke 4. The apostles, Mark 3, 6, Matthew 10, uh, 27, Luke 9, Acts 10, Acts 16, 1 Corinthians 1, Galatians 1, Ephesians 3, and for Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 1. In all these places, Griffiths is saying, is these people are commissioned to go preach, and they are commissioned to do so by a higher authority, either Jesus himself or one of the elders. And so Griffiths says, uh, according to the New Testament, in order to preach the word, that person needs to be ordained by the Holy Catholic Church, right? It's not just some little church deciding to do whatever it wants to do, but it's the church, the elders, um, giving that authority um, because they sense that this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. Furthermore, he says, it's significant that none of our three semi-technical verbs for preaching the gospel are used anywhere in the New Testament to frame an instruction, command, or commission for believers in general to preach. Where there are generalized instructions in the New Testament for believers to communicate God's word, these instructions are expressed using different vocabulary. See, so what Griffiths is saying, when you study these words, yes, everybody's supposed to go share the gospel. The women at the tomb are supposed to go share the gospel. Everybody has to do that, not just pastors. But when people are uh, commanded to preach, it's always these three words. It's not these general words. And the people who are commanded to preach, they're always um, in a position to be an elder, in a position to be ordained by the church. So how do those two things fit together? Preaching the word and the sacraments. Well, the Reformed say that though there isn't anything explicit in the New Testament about elders only administering the sacraments, the Reformed say, well, what is the sacrament? The sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are visible depictions of the proclaimed word. And since it's only elders and pastors who are to proclaim the word, then therefore, by logical consequence, it should only be elders and pastors who dispense the sacraments. And in addition to that, if, it's, if anybody's dispensing the sacraments, how could we practice 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul tells people, don't partake of this sacrament in an unworthy way? So all this goes to say is that the elders, th- this is the biblical case for the elder rule of the church. This is why we in the Christian Reformed Church say that elders are the overseers of the church. Okay. Now, it's really important for us to mention at this moment that as we're understanding the way that Jesus has told his church to be run, the way that he governs the church, it's really important for us to understand something called the, um, the ordinary versus the special offices of the church. Ordinary or special, other people will call it ordinary or extraordinary, um, like extraordinary, aside from ordinary. What this means is that there's two types of ways people get ordained in the church. The, fir- the first way is the special ordination, which I just described. That's when an elder comes before the church or a deacon, and the church lays hands on them and says, in the name of the Holy Spirit, we are ordaining you to this office. You now have Um, You are licensed by the church of God to preach God's word and to administer the sacraments for elders and for deacons. uh, You are are ordained to um, dispense the the mercy funds of the church. 
That's special, meaning it's specific for a certain group. But the Reformed have always said, in addition to that, there is the ordinary office of believers. And the ordinary office applies to everybody who's a member of the church. And the ordinary office allows people to do things that are very, very similar to pastors. So in the special office, there's preaching, right? We just saw that only elders should preach or pastors. In the uh, ordinary office, there's evangelism. So though pastors are the only ones who should preach, every single member of the church should evangelize, should share the good news, should talk to people about Jesus, should pick up their Bible, read some verses, and say, this is what I think this means. Every single person, uh, men and women, this is the ordinary office. And we could multiply examples, but the point is that we really have to be very, very careful that when we're talking about what the elders do, we don't go down the Roman Catholic route that says elders are these special people and they have special access to God and they're the only ones who do religious stuff. And we little plebeian parishioners who don't have this special calling from God, we don't really, we, we can't do those things. Right? And it got so bad that in the Roman Catholic Church, the church left the Bible in Latin so that the people couldn't even read it for themselves because they're the lowly plebeians and we need to leave that spiritual work to the priests. So the Reformed absolutely reject that notion. We say, yeah, there's certain things we should only do as elders, but ordinary members of the church, and these aren't the best words, ordinary and special, right? That's, it doesn't mean one's better than the other. It just means... This applies to a small group of people, and this applies to all people. But the Reformers said this, this category uh, is really, really important for us to hold on to because it's not that the elders are better. It's just that they have been given a very specific task to go into the pulpit, to prepare God's word, and to preach it in a way that says, thus saith the Lord. This is an authoritative message. Whereas in the uh, ordinary um, ordination uh, you're not speaking on behalf of the church. You say, this is what I think this word means. And you share that with somebody. And that's good and proper. But you're not sharing it as a representative of the church. So you see, these are are kind of fine distinctions, but this is the way we believe the church has, uh, Jesus has set up the church. Okay, so what this is talking about is Jesus cleansing his bride, right? This is the way in which Jesus prepares his bride. So when you see an elder, I mean, this is a beautiful thing to me. I mean, just, just think about this for a second. Like Jesus sees his church. He says, you're all connected together. I'm going to send you office bearers, these elders, to lead you. And so when you see an elder, I mean, obviously things can go wrong. There can be bad elders, right? We're not, we're not all sanctified yet. But the way that it's supposed to work and the way that it often works is that when you see an elder, you are seeing a representative of Christ who has been ordained by the Holy Spirit, who God has said, yes, this is the man who I have ordained to cleanse you with the water of the word, to bring you closer to Christ. I mean, that's a beautiful thing when you think about the church, right? Elders aren't just some guys who are back in the back room voting on the budget, right? But they are emissaries of Christ, sent by Christ himself to sanctify you and make you holy. So it's a beautiful thing when it operates the correct way. And that is precisely why when pastors and elders act in a sinful way, it's so much more tragic. It's tragic when a Christian misrepresents Christ, but when a pastor or an elder misrepresents Christ, it's extremely tragic and extremely damaging because people look to the pastor and the elder and say, you are supposed to represent Christ to me. The church has slapped the seal of approval on you through the Spirit and said, you are a representative. And so if you poorly represent Christ, they might be tempted to think that this is what Christ is like. And this is why the church needs to take an extremely rigorous uh, view towards the ordination of pastors and elders. This isn't just a, hey, you went and got some degree and you passed some test and now you're ready to be an elder or a pastor. But we need to be rigorous and ensure not just through human means of testing and making sure this person understands things, but also by examining their conduct and making sure this person is actually a God-fearing Christian. That is why 
when you look at the requirements for elders in Titus 1 and, and 1 Timothy 3, 22 or, or 21 or 20 to 21 of the 22 requirements are all just Christian virtues. Being a God-fearing person, not addicted to much wine, not greedy, not contentious. Most of the requirements for an elder and for a pastor are not, you need to know a bunch of stuff, but you need to be a godly person because they're representatives of Christ. Okay, so that's elders. That's how the church is structured. And lastly, what we need to talk about here, this is the third point in your notes. Lastly, what we need to talk about is um, the gender distinction here. So the Reformed Church has always taught up until 1970, uh, and this church still teaches this, that men are the only ones who are permitted to uh, be ordained to the office of elder. Uh, We won't get into deacon because deacons aren't um, authoritative. They um, They don't govern. And so there's a disagreement over whether females can be deacons, and we can get into that another day. Um, but that's not quite as important because uh, what's very clear in Scripture, in my opinion, uh, and the opinion of every Reformed person ever up until 1970, is that the Word of God is extremely clear that men are the only ones who are to be ordained. Theologically, part of the reason for that it goes back to what we were talking about in the sermon. God has made men and women to be different in order to function in different ways. And so men's job in life, in the world, in the family, and in the church is, generally speaking, to be sacrificial leaders. And women's job, generally speaking, in the world, in the family, and the church, is to be submissive, submissive helpers and supporters. The men are supposed to protect the women and ensure that they flourish, and the women are supposed to support them as they're doing that. You know, to quote Jerry Maguire, help you help me, right? The, 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 that's what the man's supposed to say to the woman. You need to help me so I can help you. Right? That's, that's the goal. And we see this pattern all throughout history. The elders in the Old Testament were all men. Uh, God uses male pronouns to refer to the Father and the Son, and even at times, Uh, the Spirit. Jesus uh, was the Son of God, not the daughter of God. Uh, Leadership in the Bible uh, is almost always done by men. There are a few instances, like in the Old Testament, we have Deborah who steps up to be a judge over Israel, but uh, Deborah is stepping up to be a judge over Israel because none of the men were willing to do it. And so God's not saying, yeah, here's a case where women are leading the church, but instead he's saying, look what happens when men fail to do their jobs women uh, feel the need to step up and do it for them. And so that Deborah is just really um, an instance of shame upon the men in Old Testament Israel who weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. So a key text for this, um, we could spend a whole lecture on why uh, God calls men um, to be leaders of the church. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, and you can literally see male leadership all the way from Adam and Eve all the way to the end in Revelation. But a key text uh, is 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul is um, telling Timothy uh, how Timothy is supposed to run his church. Timothy is a new elder, and Paul is a senior elder. And so Paul is writing this letter, uh, which is called a pastoral letter, Um, instructing Timothy how he should run the church. And this is what he says. He says, Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. A woman... Now, again, he's referring to the government of the church here. He's not just saying people in the pews, but here's how I want the church to be governed, Timothy. Verse 11, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, so he's pointing back to Genesis, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self 
restraint. And so very clearly here, Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. What does an elder do? He teaches and he exercises authority. So it's very clear here that Paul is saying uh, women are not uh, supposed to be ordained to the office of elder. And Paul's not saying, hey, this is just for you, Timothy. This is just for this one church. But he says, this is the way it's always been since Adam and Eve. And he points back to Adam and Eve to show, hey, Adam should have stepped up and taken the lead with his wife, but he failed to, failed to protect his wife. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. So there's another point that needs to be made as we close here. That's similar to this distinction between ordinary and special. And that is that uh, men and women are complementary. Not hierarchical. The point here is that men and women, according to the Bible, have complementary roles. The man is given a certain role that is distinct from the woman. The woman is giving a, given a certain role that is distinct from the man. The man is called to lead and to teach, uh, and the woman is not called to lead and teach. The woman is called to submit and bear children. The man is not called to submit to his wife and bear children. These are distinct roles. They complement one another. What this does not mean is that men and women uh, have different value. Women have just as much value uh, than men. A Christian woman has more value than a non-Christian man because she will forever glorify God in heaven. So this is not a statement about value, but it's a statement about role. And this is the way Christ has set up his church. And when we do this, part of what we see is that this is what we'd expect. Jesus came to lead the church. He came to be the, the lead pastor and all the other pastors are under him. You know, he's the Pope. We don't have a Pope. It's Jesus. He's the guy in charge. And so the people below him, what's their job? Representing Christ. And so it makes sense that Christ would say, I want a man to do this because I'm a man, Jesus says. So this is precisely what we would expect. All of these things that we've just mentioned uh, today, especially this last point, but all the other points of authority, submissiveness, doctrine, uh, churches having authority over one another. All of these things are not popular today. But I would submit to you that these things are actually very good for us because obviously God has given them to us. This is the way that God leads the church. But also, when these things work well, when the church is connected and the pastors and the elders are taking responsibility and the church is doing the things that they're supposed to do, it's extremely beneficial for the church because we are not only reading the word of God for ourselves and trying to learn what it means, but we are placed as it were into the warp and the woof of the word of God. We're placed into the milieu of the word of God. We, we are living in the word of God when we're living in a proper church. And so now not only am I growing by reading the words on the page, but I'm growing by interacting with the other people in my church. And God has designed it this way to increasingly make us more like him to the point where the bride of Christ, the church, will one day have no spot or wrinkle or any such thing and will be presented to him in glory. So ecclesiology sounds boring, but I think it's a topic well worth your serious consideration and study because it's a glorious picture to us all of how much Christ loves the church And it gives you the opportunity to come to church every Sunday and see your elders, see your deacons, hear about classes and synod and the way our churches function, and to be reminded that Jesus is still using all of these things that he instituted back in the book of Acts, using all these things for our good. It's a testament to his faithfulness, and his faithfulness will never end. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for the church and the way you govern it. Help us to... uh, Think clearly about the way you run the church, Jesus. Help us to submit to your leadership. And Lord, we pray that your church will be run exactly as you have prescribed it to be run run for us in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.